Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host and also the director of Christian Answers. This is Christian Answers and I want to thank you for being with us today. As you noticed from watching previous shows, we cover different topics uh, really on a wide range of, of subjects. Sometimes we deal with biblical theology, sometimes uh, heresies of one sort or another, sometimes religious movements, world religions. Well, today our topic is Mormonism. In fact, we've been covering this subject for a while now. This is episode number four in this series on Mormonism. And to help me in discussing this very, I think, a fascinating and interesting topic, this, this particular religious and contemporary movement, you might say, are two experts on this subject, uh, the director and assistant director of Utah Missions Incorporated out of Marlowe, Oklahoma. First of all, I'll, I'd like to introduce the, the director of Utah Missions, Mike Reynolds. Hi, Mike, Larry. Good, good to, to have you, with you. Thank yes. you. And of course, uh, immediately behind you there is our, your, your associate, actually, uh, with Utah Missions Incorporated. Robert McKay. Robert, great to have you here once again, mm -hmm. brother. I'd like to take a few moments here and uh, let Mike and Robert, if you want to say anything, uh, explain a little bit about your, your ministry, Utah Missions. I do have one of your publications right here, The Evangel. And if you could talk a little bit about The Evangel, maybe uh, there's a way for people watching right now to obtain this. Sure. And uh, a little bit more about your ministry and what you do. <clears throat> The uh, Utah Missions Incorporated was founded in 1954 uh, in, Salt, in Salt Lake City, or in Utah. It was moved to Oklahoma in 1972, and the Evangel is the oldest and largest publication dealing with Mormonism in the world uh, in continuous operation. Uh, it's sent out every, um, every other month to um, thousands of people in all 50 states, all U.S. territories, and 81 countries around the world. And your viewers can obtain a free subscription to that by calling uh, right now or anytime to 1-800-654-3992. They call during the daytime. They'll get one of our staff to answer the phone and help them with their questions and, and take down all the information. If they call after hours, they'll get an answering machine. And all they have to do is leave all the pertinent information there. And our staff will take it down in their free packet of materials and their first introductory uh, copy of the evangel will be on its way to them within a day or two. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Now the evangel, uh, if someone were to call and try to obtain this, what will what, what type of articles and material would they be finding well, in the Well the material evangel? deals with various things. We keep you up to date on what's going on in the world of Mormonism. Uh, we talk about um, current events, uh, what's happening in the church, what's going on in Utah, which is uh, more than 75 percent Mormon. Uh, we talk about uh, some of the uh, doctrinal issues, what, what are the doctrinal differences between Mormonism and Christianity, uh, maybe doctrinal changes or shifts within Mormonism. Uh, we also cover um, uh, tips on how to witness to Mormons. We review books dealing with Mormonism. Uh, Robert even has a column on the RLDS Church, the Organized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints out of Independence, Missouri, the second largest group. From time to time we cover uh, some of the 217 other splinter groups to show that Mormonism is not the one big monstrosity it claims to be. Uh, we cover just anything that has to do with Mormonism, we try to take a look at it. We even have news brief articles, we give you quotes from the current prophet, things he said along with uh, my comments about what he said, um, and various things like that. We just everything from book reviews to, uh, we also, in the, in the, in the paper we offer um, books um, uh, to, for folks to read and to see, uh, a lot of free materials, that sort of thing. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, of, one of the things in the evangel I've noticed uh, that, that I've always liked is a certain column in here called uh, A Piece of My Mind. And Robert, could you tell me a little bit more about that column? Well, basically, I just give away pieces of my mind. <laughs> it's an opinion column. So mostly I talk about things relating to the Mormon church. Sometimes I may get uh, a real strange notion and talk about something else. People can call that 1-800 number and get a copy of this. I highly recommend it. And uh, as long as we're, we're on this subject, I might, or on the subject of offering things, I might as well tell people about our own ministry, uh, the Christian Answers. Those uh, people watching can also contact our ministry, Christian Answers, here in Austin, Texas. And this is one of our past issues, our Christian Answers journal. Uh, we have a free resource list we offer 
that uh, lists over 60 video titles. It has over 300 audio tapes on all kinds of subjects, dealing from uh, biblical theology through cults and the occult, uh, religious debates, all types of things. And this is, of course, uh, free to anyone that wants to call or write us and obtain a, a free Christian Answers resource list. So uh, call that number or uh, write us, drop us a postcard or whatever, and we'll mail it right out to you. So uh, with that said, gentlemen, let's now turn our attention to the subject at hand, which would be the subject of, of course, Mormonism. In our previous installments, we, we covered a lot of the, uh, the different doctrines of Mormonism. We showed the semantic differences. We showed how a Mormon can say Jesus Christ, and it'll mean one thing to, let's say, a, Mormon, uh, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a Mormon, and it'll mean another thing, let's say, to someone who goes to an Orthodox Evangelical Baptist Church, let's say. Uh, and just briefly, for those who missed our previous shows, uh, either one of you, I'll, whoever wants to take the ball first, can uh, just elaborate a little bit on some of the terminology differences. Uh, Robert, uh, looks like uh, Mike's giving it over to you, so you get to carry the ball. Uh, just elaborate a little bit on the, uh, some of the terminology differences. Uh, uh, the Mormons always try to come across as being Christians just like anyone else. Mm -hmm. But what's the problem when it comes to the uh, theological terminology? Well, the... Uh Mormon Church does redefine theological terms. It's as if I took a dictionary and kept all the words, but rewrote the definitions, kind of altered the plot of the book, I guess. Uh, just as a, for instance, uh, more, the Mormon Church talks about God and what their first article of faith in, in Mormon scripture says, we believe in God, the eternal Father. But the Mormon God is an exalted man. He used to be mortal just like us. He could cease to be God. In fact, it is entirely possible, carrying Mormon doctrine to its logical conclusion, that the Mormon God was an atheist before he became God. And, and that is totally unlike what a Christian means when he says God. And as we did in previous episodes, we could go down a whole list of words that Mormonism and Christianity have in common and the meanings are entirely fundamentally different. Well, let me give you, let me give a few examples here just to reiterate what we're trying to stress here. Uh, I've got some quotes from actual uh, Mormon uh, teachings and I'd like your comments on this. Well, this will just give the viewers at home, especially those that missed previous episodes, a little taste of what, what you're trying to talk about here. Uh, first of all, the subject of God. I'll give a quote here. Quote, First, God himself who sits enthroned in yonder heavens is a man like unto one of yourselves. That is the great secret. This is a quote by Joseph Smith, Jr., the Mormon prophet, mm -hmm. the one who wrote the Book of Mormon, from his Times and Seasons, Volume 5, pages 613 through 614. And then one more quote here. Many men say there is one God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost are only one God. I say this is a strange God anyhow. Three and one and one and three all are to be crammed into one God. It would make the biggest God in all the world. He would be a wonderfully big God. He would be a giant or a monster. That's from Joseph Fielding Smith, Teachings of the Pro Prophet Joseph Smith, page 372. I could go on on this, but now here you have two Mormon prophets speaking about the nature of God. Actually, it was one. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith was compiled by Joseph Fielding Smith, but it's quoting Joseph Smith himself. Right who, of course, was the founder of the Mormon Church and thus has some great weight in the, in, in the I church. I always thought that Joseph Smil Fielding Smith was a, uh, was a prophet, too. He was. He was the 10th prophet and the great nephew of Joseph Smith. Right. So he was a prophet, but in this case, he's quoting right. in a compilation. It doesn't, it doesn't change the meaning. It's uh, just a point that if a Mormon were to hear you say Joseph Fielding Smith said that, he'd think you didn't know what you were talking about. Right. And it, even though the meaning of the quote is exactly the same. Okay, so what we have here is a classic uh, definition that uh, God is a man. Exactly. According to Mormonism. According to the Mormon in Church. Their, in their prophet. And that brings up a question. If Mormonism is Christian and Christianity doesn't believe that, we have a problem. Who's the real Christian church here? Exactly. Now let me uh, go to another quote here. This is now about Jesus Christ. Quote, we say it was Jesus Christ who was married to be brought into the relation whereby he could see his seed before he was crucified. And this is a quote by Brigham Young from his Journal of Discourses, volume 2, page 82. One more quote, the Savior was begotten by the Father of his spirit, by the same being who is the Father of our spirits, and that is 
all the organic difference between Jesus Christ and you and me. Also from Brigham Young from his Journal of Discourses, Volume 4, pages 217 to 218. So mm -hmm. what we have here, give us a, uh, for those of us not familiar with Mormon uh, theology, let's say, what is, what is Brigham Young trying to say here about Jesus Christ from these quotes? Well, putting it uh, hopefully not undelicately but bluntly, he's saying that God the Father, being an exalted man, came down and slept with Mary, and that's how Jesus was conceived. That is contrary to the Book of Mormon, it's contrary to the Bible, and it's contrary to 2,000 years of Christian doctrine, but to this day, that's what the Mormon Church teaches. Now, they deny it, Larry. They deny it today, and many Mormons don't know that the Church teaches it. But Brigham Young said in the Journal of Discourses, a book of sermons uh, that mainly uh, contains sermons by him and other Mormon leaders, Brigham Young was the second prophet of the Mormon Church. He said in Volume 8 of that series of sermons, the birth of the Savior, a reference to Jesus, was as natural as are the births of our children. Yeah, no Christian would deny that. that. That's true. But he goes further. If he had stopped there, he would have been orthodox, but he didn't stop there. It was the result of natural action, he said. We partake, he partook of flesh and blood and was begotten of his Father as we were by our fathers. It's volume 8 of the Journal of Discourses, pages, uh, page 115. So uh, the second prophet of the Mormon church obviously believed that Jesus was the result of natural action between God and Mary, just as Robert said. Mm -hmm. In fact, as late as 1972, the church officially taught that in a journal, in a family home evening um, manual, uh, which the church um, produces officially to help um, their um, uh, families have their family devotions. And it basically said, if you're having trouble teaching your children about the origin of God, use this chart. And I wish I had thought about it. I would have brought a picture with me, the magazine with me, and I didn't. But it shows God and Mary. I mean, excuse me, she says, Mom and Dad. She used this chart. Tell them that, you know, you loved your children, so therefore, because you loved each other, the children came to be. It shows the stick figures, Mommy, Daddy, lines drawn, Baby. It says, uh, Heavenly Father, Mary, lines drawn, Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, That's very clear. Yeah. And oh, yes. Mormon Apostle Orson Pratt said that the father was married to Mary for time, not for eternity, but for time so that he would not be committing adultery in what he did. Oh, wow. Well. well, you know, it's interesting, too. Uh, when I was doing a lot of research on Mormonism years back and doing a lot of Mormon evangelism, uh, I found that, and this might be a tip for anyone watching this show, uh, here in Austin, there's a big university, University of Texas, and they got these big libraries, and they happen to have the whole, the, the whole, all the volumes of the Journal of Discourses by Brigham Young over here in the Perry Castaneda Library. And so I could go in uh, from off the street and go in there and look up anything Brigham Young said. And so I, I'm sure if this town has a set, there's other cities that have libraries that would have his Journal of Discourses. And since he proclaimed to be, you know, speaking for God and, and as a prophet of God in Mormonism, it seems that Mormons today uh, also would want to avail themselves of this information from Brigham Young. Uh, do you think uh, most Mormons would do that, go to the library and look up what Brigham Young had to say? Would it be considered scripture then? In our experience, uh, to answer the first question first, a radical concept perhaps, uh, most Mormons when given the opportunity to look things up for themselves, don't. We have a standing offer. As long as you don't request a, an unreasonable amount, say 100 pages of Xerox, Xeroxes, we'll send them to you free. We have the Journal of Discourses and thousands, what over about? 2, over 2,000 volumes. Over 2,000 volumes in our library, plus 800 separate titles, Mormon titles on a CD-ROM that we can print, and we'll send you that for no charge, as long as I say you're not asking for an unreasonable amount. Uh, so the information is there, we can check it, we challenge Mormons to do it, very seldom does one actually want to look at it. Uh, as to whether that's considered scripture or not, yes and no. Or as we discussed uh, the uh, the Deion Sanders School of Theology, both. Uh, according to the Doctrine and Covenants 68.4, anything any Mormon says at any time is scripture if he speaks is moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Uh, so, and, and so if Brigham Young was speaking as moved upon by the Holy Ghost, what he said was scripture. He certainly thought so. He, he said that his sermons, when he'd reviewed them for pr publication, as happened with the Journal of Discourses, were as good scripture as anything in the Bible. And, and uh, in the eighth volume of the Journal of Discourses, in the preface to it, it said this 
set deserves to be one of the standard works of the church. The term standard works refers to the Mormon scriptures. But Mormons today don't consider the journal to be scripture. In fact, most Mormons don't know what's in there, and when you quote it to them, they'll say, that's just his opinion, or that's out of context, or that's not official. So the answer is both. <laughs> and a good reply to that would be, well, certainly the prophet knew what he said and meant what he said and said what he meant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, or a question to ask is, whom should I believe knows more about Mormonism, you or the prophet? Good question. Yeah. Exactly. I may disagree with Brigham Young's theology, but I must, I must uh, conclude that he understood that theology and, and, and preached it accurately. And to me, it's just... I mean, it's obvious if he was a prophet of God and, and here like in this city, uh, the libraries have his volumes of his journal of discourses, why wouldn't it be useful to them today? But it sounds like people aren't really paying that much attention to it. And basing their, to me, it looks like a fallacy in their own theology. Mm -hmm. If anyone speaks for God as moved by the Holy Ghost, as you were just saying, then it kind of, if one guy says he's being moved on by the Holy Ghost and it contradicts something, let's say Brigham Young said in the Journal of Discourses, then who's got the Holy Ghost and who's telling the truth? How do you, how do you tell? Where's the standard of uh, uh, figuring out the, you know, the, the right one? Well, anyway, you, you just mentioned the Holy Ghost, and let me go to a quote now on the Mormon idea of the Holy Ghost, or as uh, Christians usually say, the Holy Spirit. Here's a quote. The Holy Ghost is the third member of the Godhead. He is a personage of spirit, a spirit person, a spirit man, a spirit entity. He can be in only one place at one time, and he does not and cannot transform himself into any other form or image than that of the man whom he is. Here we have that term again, man. The man whom he is, though his power and influence can be manifest at one and the same time through all immensity, end quote. That's from Bruce McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, page 359, and of course I just happen to have a copy of, of that right here. So, uh, any comments? Uh, other than to say that is Mormon doctrine, but it has never been Christian doctrine, there's not much to say. Bruce McConkie had one thing going for him, or against him, depending on your viewpoint. Uh, he set, stated Mormon doctrine so plainly there's no misunderstanding it. Hey. <clears throat> the only problem, Larry, is, is that uh, the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit are not the same thing in Mormonism. Uh, you said so Christians would call it the Holy Spirit. That's true, we would. But at the same time, no Mormon would call the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit. They're two separate entities. The reason for that was Joseph Smith claimed to be able to read Greek. <laughs> and you know as well as I do, the King James Version of the Bible <clears throat> uses the word ghost and spirit interchangeably in translating the one Greek word, neuma, meaning wind or spirit. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, spirit is a better rendering of the meaning because when we think of a ghost, we think of a disembodied spirit of a dead person. That's what our minds say. And, and for that matter, most do. But in that time period, they were used interchangeably in 1611 when the King James was translated. Well, Joseph Smith saw the two different words being used and concluded based on his vast knowledge of the Greek language, uh, no sarcasm <laughs> intended, of course, that uh, they were two separate beings. And I was just looking, I, I went and looked on my um, computer screen here to see if I could find it. And sure enough, um, uh, James E. Talmadge, a Mormon apostle, wrote in his book, Articles of Faith, the term spirit and ghost occur in the scriptures without differentiation. Now, notice he's telling you they mean the same thing. Now he's, he's, but, but listen, he's not finished. If he'd stopped there, he'd have been Christian. But he didn't stop there. He said, the Holy Ghost is an individual person. It's the third member of the Godhead, as you quoted a moment ago. The Holy Spirit, is, a, in a distinctive sense, is the divine essence by means which the Godhead operates upon man and in nature. In other words, something quite different than the Holy Ghost. Um, Milton R. Hunter, uh, uh, 70, when he wrote this, said, The Spirit of God was also provided to serve with the Holy, with the Holy Ghost as another guide for man in helping him to establish communication with the Eternal Father. Mm -hmm. so establishing once again that there are two separate entities. One is a third member of the Godhead and another is just out there somewhere, whatever it is. Well, what's interesting here, and I think we discussed this in previous shows, uh, is that from what we've just read and quoted from Mormon theology, uh, I know that Mormonism teaches that God is a man with flesh and bones. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we have the Holy Ghost here that, as McConkie was saying, is a man, 
but he's a spirit man. He's mm -hmm. apparently he's trying to come across mm -hmm. with an idea. There's no flesh and bones. Well, what's right. the what's the problem here? Well, the founder of our ministry, John L. Smith, wanted to know one time what the Holy Ghost did wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he breaks all the rules for becoming a god. You know, Larry, as well as we do, that the uh, eternal progression concept of Mormonism means that you have to gain a body, mm -hmm. attain a body, in order to do the things, do all the rituals and ordinances necessary to gain exaltation to heaven, right? Right. Well, what happened to the Holy Ghost? What did he do wrong? Why, why did he get to have a, a become a god without having a body? Mm -hmm. He well, breaks all the rules. Well, how is this explained by Mormon prophets and apostles? Well, I haven't seen one yet. It isn't. And it's worth uh, noting that when Lucifer rebelled and became Satan, his punishment was to never have a body. It would seem that in Mormonism, the Holy Ghost is suffering the same punishment as Lucifer. <laughs> Now, Mormonism doesn't teach that, I want to make right. that clear, but that seems to be the logical conclusion of what the church does teach. Right, so it, it sounds like another uh, internal problem in, in the theology. One of many. One of many, <laughs> yes. Well, let's uh, try one more and then we'll move on. Uh, this time uh, on the terminology difference of salvation itself. Here's a quote, and uh, you were just mentioning this man a minute ago, Mike. Quote, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. End quote. That's from James E. Talmadge, the Articles of Faith, Numbers 3 and 4. Another quote. Uh, quote, full salvation is attained by virtue of knowledge, truth, righteousness, and all true principles. Many conditions must exist in order to make such salvation available to men. Without continuous revelation, the ministering of angels, the working of miracles, the prevalence of the gifts of the Spirit, there would be no salvation. There is no salvation outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. End quote. That's from Bruce R. McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, page 6-7. Yet I've had Mormons tell me that all of us are, uh, they've come back and said, and I've asked them, uh, they've, they've, they've come at me with something um, about salvation, and I'll say, well, is there any salvation or any uh, gaining of exaltation or eternal life outside the Mormon church? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You, you, you're as Christian as we are. We're all Christians, and, and I keep, keep hammering the point, can I gain exaltation because uh, without the Mormon church? But, uh, Robert, why don't you handle the salvation in, I'll handle the exaltation in. Uh, you know, there's two types of salvation we're talking here. That's the confusion. Actually, when you come right down to it, there are three. That's right. Uh, That's right. There's a sal general salvation. What Mormons usually mean when they say salvation, everybody's saved. Everybody's raised from the dead. Uh, everybody's saved. Uh, if you ask a Mormon if he's saved, he'll say yes. But then so are Muslims, Hindus, atheists, everyone. That's individual salvation, or general salvation, excuse me. Then there's individual salvation. That, those are, these are people who are not only raised from the dead, but gain an inheritance in the middle of the three kingdoms of glory, the uh, terrestrial kingdom. Uh, I believe we talked about that some in the last uh, mm -hmm. episode. Right, we did. Uh, these are people who uh, are in the presence of Jesus, but not the Father. They're above those who are in the presence of the Holy Ghost. So I, I suppose it's a, a little better. The interesting thing about these two uh, kinds of salvation, general and individual, in Mormonism, that's damnation. But it is a glory greater than any we can imagine. Uh, if I have to choose between being a Mormon and being a Christian, between being exalted and being damned, I'll take being a Christian because Mormon damnation is a salvation greater than I can ever imagine. And that takes us to exaltation. Yeah, exaltation is something you have to earn. You have to gain it. You have to... Um uh, do all the right things, perform all the right ordinances, or be dead for a year and have them done for you by Mormons in the temple. This ties in what I was just yeah. reading from Talmud. Right, and right. You have to do all these things, all these uh, baptisms, all these things, do, go on your mission, do all the right thing, you know, all those things that they do to earn their eternal life. And then maybe, possibly, could be, if they've done enough, maybe they might get it somewhere on the other side of the veil. But Joseph Smith, two things I want to point out to that. The current uh, <clears throat> member of the First Presidency, Thomas S. Munson, said in an Ensign article, that's the official magazine of the church, some years ago, that these celestial kingdom, that's the highest level, or celestial things or exaltation has to be earned. Three terms are synonymous, celestial kingdom, exaltation, and eternal life. All of those things, they have to be earned. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that uh, once, they, uh, once you die, you may not know if you've made it. Joseph Smith said, even on the other side of the veil, 
Even after you die, there may still be, you still may not get to rest. There may still be things you have to do and, that, and you still won't know if you have gained enough to gain exaltation. There, there's an interesting hierarchy of uh, uh, going up from surety to doubt. The, the closer you get to being what Mormonism wants you to be, the less certainty you have. If you're not a Christian at all, you're guaranteed to be saved. If you're a Christian, you might even gain individual salvation. Might, probably not. If you're a Mormon, unless you're a real bad Mormon, you'll gain individual salvation. But the, but the minute you begin trying to earn exaltation, then the doubt creeps in. You might not have done all that's required. You might have failed somewhere. Uh, even after death, you're not there yet. Whereas in Christianity, we say all Christians will gain eternal life. No question about it. All who trust Jesus will gain eternal life. Because the shed blood of Christ covers all their sins. Exactly. Right, and it's enough. In Mormonism, He's enough for both of us. In Mormonism, there is no guarantee that even the prophet will gain eternal life when it's all said and done. Well, uh, I think we covered this in a previous show, too, that the blood of Christ in Mormonism, uh, there are certain sins that's not good enough to cleanse you of. Right. And right. Uh, I think that's... Well, that's I, one of the primary differences, Larry, between Christianity and any other religion in the world, is that all, a lot of religions have hope. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Islam, uh, uh, Buddhist, Mormons, whatever, they all have hope. They all have hope. They just don't have any assurance. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I think about, um, it's amazing, you know, the squeaky wheel always gets the, the grease. Um, uh, years ago, we never heard Mormons say they knew they had eternal life. We'd ask them, do you know if you were going to heaven? I mean, if you know that you have eternal life, that's how we'd phrase it. Uh, and they would go, well, gee, I don't know, I hope so. But I noticed that after we did the, um, <clears throat> after the, the fifth or sixth week of outreach at the San Diego Temple a few years ago, they began to reply by saying, yes, I know. But they don't know. According to their prophet, they can't possibly know. And yet 1 John 5, 13 says, Beloved, I write these things unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I guess the bottom line to everything we're saying here is that uh, there's just no way they can really know if That's they've right. done enough. The How do you really know you've done enough of these right. ordinances? And, and, when do you know, and when is enough enough? Mm -hmm. And exactly. when do you know? Right. And They'll and never know that. What are the right things to do? Right. On, That's on the bottom line. On this subject, the only thing the best Mormon on earth knows is that he'll get nothing more than I get. And I'm, well, let me rephrase that. I'm an apostate. I used to be a member of the church. Now I'm quote unquote an anti-Mormon. So I, I'm, an, I'm in a different case. But a Mormon knows he'll get salvation. And so will you. And mm -hmm. so will Mike. And so will everybody else. Beyond that, he doesn't know anything. Why be a Mormon? So uh, as we were discussing uh, this idea of salvation, you brought up the exaltation and, and salvation. Uh, I'm not sure if we've covered it before, but we'll briefly cover it now. Uh, this brings us to this idea of uh, the, the damnation you mentioned and hell. What is, what is the Mormon hell like? What, what, is, what is a good definition of, 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 of hell in Mormonism? Well, if you get, I, I always kind of jokingly say it's, like, uh, it's a little like Buddhism. If you get enough good karma, you can get out. It's there. Uh, it's mentioned. They talk about it. They can't escape it since the Bible mentions it. Uh, mostly what I read, and Robert, you can correct me or help me out here in a minute, but um, um, one of the things I read, Larry, is, is, that, is that if you go there, uh, you can earn your way out. You can, you can work, you work it out where you get to get out. And almost everybody will get out eventually. Uh, it's quite opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says the road to, to heaven is narrow, but the road to hell is wide. Mormonism says the exact opposite. Uh, that's, that's one of the threads in Mormon theology. I haven't done a lot of research into hell specifically. Uh, but that's one of the threads that, that has been in Mormon theology is that once you, you, you can go there, but you can get out. Uh, another one is that if you go there, eventually you'll just be destroyed and reduced down to your element and, and eventually become another intelligence and start the whole thing over again. Uh, then there's the theory that anything less than the celestial kingdom is hell. Uh, Mormonism has not dealt with hell very much, and so there's even less systematized theology there than elsewhere, and there is no such thing as systematic theology in the Mormon yeah, I church. I noticed that one thing you said sounds a lot like reincarnation. It does. And if I remember correctly, and I'm not going to, 
going to swear to this. I'd have to look it up. But if I remember correctly, Brigham Young once said one of the apostles was teaching re reincarnation. Mm. Well, when you have no standard to go by, that's what you come up with. Yes. Right. I see. Well, uh, based on some of these things we've just now talked about uh, in Mormon theology, of course, everything ties back to, as we've shown in previous shows, the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. And, of course, uh, I ask, you, you can usually pick one of these up free, you know, by calling that 1-800 number through the Mormon church, or the Mormon missionaries will give you one. I've got a whole bunch of them right. uh, from different years and different Yeah, we editions. buy them and have them on hand. Right? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, so this is the book. Is this supposed to be, according to Mormon theology, the most correct book of any book written uh, uh, according to their own prophets and so forth? That's, that's what Joseph Smith said, uh, but yet... In a way, it's not the book at all. It, it, uh, it gets less use than the Bible in Mormonism, even though it's supposedly more accurate than the Bible. It gets less use than other books of Mormon scripture, and all Mormon scripture gets less use than what the living prophet says. Well, now let's tie this into what we've just been discussing then. Here we've got the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. And uh, let me just ask you guys uh, something about this. Now, in the Book of Mormon, which is... I guess their standard book, and this is what the Mormon missionaries will hand you first. Mm -hmm. uh, does it mention, as in, in some of this we've been discussing now for several episodes, does it mention that God has a body of flesh and bones in no. this book? No, it doesn't. No. Does it mention that God is an exalted man? No. no. Does it say God is a product of eternal progression? No. no. Does it mention the plurality of gods? No. Only to deny it. Only to deny it. That's right. It teaches that God is, is, there's just one God. Does it uh, mention that there is no eternal hell and punishment? Only to deny that theory. <laughs> Does it uh, mention that men and women can become gods? No. No. Does it uh, mention that men's spirits pre-existed before this life? No. No. Does it uh, talk about marriage for eternity? No. This, this is a pretty easy question, huh? Yeah, so far so. <laughs> does, it, does it teach that polygamy is an abomination in God's sight? Yes, yes. yes a trick does. question with a yes answer. Uh, uh, and, of course, for those that aren't up on their vocabulary words, could you explain just briefly what polygamy is and how it ties in with Mormon doctrine? Having more than one wife, according to Mormon doctrine, God revealed it, although if you do it right now, you're an adulterer. In Brigham Young's day, you had to be, ha, have more than one wife in order to become a god. Now, if you have more than one wife, you cannot become a god. Ah. Well, okay, that, that succinctly answered that question. Does the Book of Mormon mention, as you've been discussing here, uh, the three dimensions of heaven? No. Does it say that God has a wife or wives? No. no. Does, it, uh, does it contain teachings regarding the priesthoods of the... Aaronic uh, and the Melchizedek priesthoods? No. Does it talk about uh, a denial of the priesthood to blacks? No. And in fact, just for a moment, uh, I don't think we've even discussed this, this aspect before, but uh, has Mormonism ever addressed the issue of, of uh, Afro-Americans or, or black people when it comes to priesthood in Mormonism? It has. There's a long history involved in that. Uh, uh, trying to summarize here a, a whole lot of complicated stuff. Uh, the Mormon church for a long time taught publicly and explicitly that blacks were not valiant enough in the war in heaven uh, when we all were there in pre-existence and were cursed. The mark of that curse was quote-unquote Negro features. Uh, I've, I've put that in quotes because Melanesians and Australian Aborigines, who look just as black as anyone from Africa, could hold the priesthood, but those of African descent could not. In 1978, that policy was changed. Mormon scripture contains an announcement of an announcement of an announcement of a revelation, changing that policy. The revelation itself does not exist. That's what the evidence indicates. The doctrine behind the policy has never changed, it has never been apologized for. It's never been repudiated. I have a copy of a book printed in 1984, several years after the change, which calls blacks, quote, an inferior race, unquote. One of the very few things I can honestly say I hate is bigotry and racism, and Mormonism teaches it. 
Now, it's true, as I said, the Book of Mormon doesn't teach that blacks may not have the priesthood. It does teach that a black skin is a mark of wickedness. Mm -hmm. I, hate to tell, I hate to tell the Book of Mormon this, but I've known plenty of black people who were fine folks, and I've known plenty of white people who were wicked. Skin color doesn't have a thing to do with it, but that's Mormon doctrine. And uh, is there, uh, uh, Mike, do you have any quotes? Uh, well, I was looking for some as Robert was talking, trying to find out something here. Uh, this thing remembers far more than I do. Uh, the Book of Mormon in 1 Nephi 12, 23 says, And it came to pass that I beheld, after they had dwindled in unbelief, they became a dark and loathsome and a filthy people full of idleness and all manner of abominations. That's referring to the Lamanites or the bad guys in the Book of Mormon. It also refers to the fact that uh, Cain, uh, Mormon doctrine does. Let's see if I can come up with another one here. Um, uh, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 120. Joseph Smith said, unless uh, delivering the people from priestcraft and the priests from the power of Satan should be considered abolition. He was talking about the abolition of slavery. But we do not believe in setting the Negroes free. And the reason for that was because of the curse of Cain, which was upon them, giving them a dark or black skin and therefore they were cursed people because of the fact that they did not do what they should have done in the pre-existence, which is what Robert said. And I, I seem to recall, I don't have the quote on me at the moment, but uh, from my past studies, you mentioned about the, uh, uh, the dark and loathsome, mm -hmm. but it seems like there's another Mormon quote about uh, if, if someone accomplishes something, they, they can become white and delightsome. Is there, do you, does that ring a bell with any, any yeah. of you? I, I, I guess not, but I, well, I have. It does. I, I have. Uh, Seems like I've read that somewhere in Mormon literature that there's some kind of blessing where you can become light and delightsome, or either it was talking about the Lamanites or one of the one of the races. Well, uh, there used to be. Oh, there uh, used to be. Until 1981, the Book of Mormon said that uh, when the Lamanites, who, which the Mormon Church believes to have become the American Indians, and as a side note, I'll point out, I have a full-blooded Cherokee neighbor. He's neither black nor loathsome, and he probably wouldn't appreciate being told that he is. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an ex-chief of police. I wouldn't want to tell him that. Uh, but the Book of Mormon until 1981 said that the Lamanites, when, they, when they're converted to Christ, will become white and delightsome. From that time on, it said pure and delightsome. But yet there's another place in the Book of Mormon where it gives us an account of Lamanites being converted, mm -hmm. and they became white, not pure. Hmm. So uh, it, it looks like in Mormonism, uh, they definitely had a problem with uh, black people. In fact, uh, when was the first uh, black person allowed to be a priest in the Mormon church? In the 1800s. In the 1800s? Yes. Okay. Uh, his name was Je Elijah Abel. Elijah Abel. He was a friend of Joseph Smith's, but he was denied, denied by Brigham Young his um, washings and anointings, and he died on Christmas Day, I believe, and I forget the year, on the way back from a proselyting mission. But the church doesn't like that to be known. I've, I don't think I've ever met a Mormon who'd ever heard of Elijah Abel. And uh, wasn't there a revelation from one of the Mormon prophets, like in, was it 1978? by Spencer, allegedly. allegedly allegedly allowing them now to hold a priesthood according to Mormon doctrine right. the policy has been changed but uh, the revelation is not in Mormon scripture just the announcement of an announcement of an announcement of the revelation and one apostle the grand richards who was involved in that decision said the reason was very simple in october of that year the church was going to dedicate a temple in brazil where something like 98% of the membership had black blood and that meant they could, their people couldn't even get into their own temple because of the policy, and so they changed it. Oh, I see. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I guess God can change his mind. It would seem so, given Mormonism's <laughs> doctrinal history. <laughs> I would like to mention for the viewers uh, in the Word of God, the Scriptures here in Galatians chapter 3, uh, in verses 27 and 28, the, the Word of God says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye uh, are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it doesn't really matter. Skin color doesn't matter. Exactly. We're all one in Christ, bond or free, male or female. Right. We're all one in Christ. There's no... Uh, 
there's no, uh, I, I guess God could be considered colorblind in this case. Mm -hmm. And as he says, he looks on the heart. That's mm -hmm. right. Other scriptures. Exactly. So anyway, with that, that said, uh, let's get on back here to one more question about the Book of Mormon being, as we were discussing, uh, the most correct book on the earth. It seems like it's sure missing a lot of key Mormon doctrines and teachings. It's the best anti-Mormon book ever printed. Uh, does does uh, the Book of Mormon talk about uh, uh, it being the stick of Joseph, as mentioned in Ezekiel? No, it doesn't say a thing about that. In fact, uh, I think uh, when the Book of Mormon was originally uh, put out in 1830, I think one of the, in fact, I have, actually have, if I can reach over here for a second, I actually have Joseph Smith begins his work in Book of Mormon, 1830, first edition reproduced from uncut sheets and this is put together by Wilford C. Wood. Do y'all happen to know who he is? Oh yeah, we is? sell the book. I wish I'd have known you were going to bring this up. I have an authentic reprint of the Book of Mormon 1830 edition in, in the car outside outside the studio. Oh, you do? It's printed by Deseret Books. It is an authentic reprint uh, in, in recognition of the 150th anniversary mm -hmm. of the printing of the Book of Mormon. Is and it states category, I mean it's, it, and it has a little slip inside that says authenticating it saying this is from uh, Deseret P Publishing, we did, that's the official publishing arm of the church, and it says uh, no less than five times that Joseph Smith is the author mm -hmm. of, the book, of well, the book of Mormon. I don't know if the camera can get this or not, but uh, they probably can't, but I've got, here's from the original reprint, the first page, the Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. And there's some stuff here that talks about, a lot of this has been uh, changed or taken out now, but down here underneath, it says 1830 out of Palmyra, it says, by Joseph Smith, Jr., author and proprietor. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this tie in with uh, current uh, Mormon understanding? Well, the current Book of Mormon says uh, he's the translator. When you face Mormons down with this, uh, in official teachings and other places, they'll come up and tell you, well, there was some kind of law, copyright law, required Joseph Smith to... Um, required him to say that he was the author in order to obtain a copyright. Well, we have at UMI tried to be thorough and we have checked the United States copyright law. I've even talked to US, United States copyright lawyers at the Smithsonian Institute in, um, in uh, Washington, D.C., and they have informed me and sent me publication and documentation that no such copyright ever existed. Once when Robert and I were at the Grandin Building where the publishing was done in Palmyra, New York, a Mormon missionary, a historical missionary there, tried to tell me that, oh, there was a New York State copyright law. Yeah. Now, I never had that one thrown at me. <laughs> so I got home and I called the copyright office again. And he told me up until about, now I may be off a date or two, he said up until 1978, believe it or not, there was still some state copyrights running around. Some of the state and the original colonies, original 13 states, had mm -hmm. copyright laws. But he said that was only for unpublished works. No such law exists on the books. And in 1978, all of it was brought under federal statute. There is no such copyright law requiring anyone. You can call yourself Bozo the Clown if you want to and obtain a copyright. It just doesn't matter. Okay? And, all right. Well, just to reiterate a little bit more here, too, on the following pages over and over again, it says again, Joseph Smith, Jr., author and proprietor. You go to the next page. In fact, a lot of this has been totally deleted now mm -hmm. from Book of Mormon writings. But once again, it says back here when he says some other stuff, the author. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and all this has been left out. And the real kicker, it's in the front of current editions and in the back of, of the original edition, is the testimony of eight witnesses. Yes. Today, it speaks of Joseph Smith, Jr., the translator. In that 1830 edition, it said Joseph Smith, Jr., author and proprietor. Now, that testimony was changed without the permission of the witnesses. But let's assume that Mike's wrong. Just for the sake of argument, let's assume that there is, was a copyright law that said he had to copyright it in his own name as author and proprietor. Mm -hmm. That does not account for five separate times, and it doesn't account for this testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, I personally think Joseph Smith might have written the Book of Mormon. Nobody knows for sure. He certainly thought he wrote it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that's interesting here, I've got a Mormon book here called Truth Restored, mm -hmm. uh, a short history of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, apparently published uh, by the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. It's by, by Gordon B. Hickley, mm -hmm. He's uh, Hinkley, 
the Council of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ. He's a current prophet. Ah, yes. And uh, it talks about how this Book of Mormon is authenticated because, like for instance here, you mentioned the eight witnesses, mm -hmm. but it says here the three special witnesses who bore testimony of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. You've got Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer. It has pictures of them mm -hmm. and talks about how these men are proving the veracity of uh, Joseph Smith and, and what he had to say in the Book of Mormon. And this is current. I guess they still talk about the eight witnesses right. and, the, and the three witnesses. And Just I believe for a two of those three died outside the church, didn't they, Robert? Yeah, let's, let's, uh, if y'all could uh, tell me just for a minute, uh, tell me a little bit about Oliver Cowdery. Uh, and well, let's go through these three witnesses real quick. We won't go into the eight witnesses, but maybe you can tell me a few things about these three witnesses that are supposed to prove the veracity of the Book of Mormon. What can you say about Oliver, Oliver Cowdery? Oliver Cowdery, if memory serves, and I am working off straight memory here, Joseph Smith was working on the Book of Mormon with the help of his wife <clears throat> and uh, Martin Harris, I believe, and Cowdery showed up, and within short order, the Book of Mormon was finished. Uh, Oliver Cowdery was uh, a close friend and associate, but I believe that later on, Joseph Smith called him a liar and a number of other things, and he was excommunicated. Martin Harris um, was the gentleman who put up the money uh, his wife didn't like, his wife liked Joseph Smith uh, about like a hang, like she like a hangnail. Um, he was, uh, I don't know how many different religions he'd been attached to in his lifetime. He was in and out of the Mormon church several times. I believe he died inside the Mormon church, but only after being two or three other things in between leaving it and coming back. Um, Martin Harris, I've covered Cowdery and Harris. Who's the other one? David Whitmer. David Whitmer. Now, Robert, you know more about him. He was an interesting person. Uh, I know more about him than I do about the other two put together. David Whitmer, in 1838, uh, said in his address to all believers in Christ, said that in 1838, God told him by an audible voice to leave the church. And he said that testimony was equally reliable with his testimony to the Book of Mormon. In other words, if the testimony of the three witnesses signed by David Whitmer is true, then it is equally true that God told him to leave the church. He died outside the church. He tried to start his own, and it never really got anywhere. Uh, he never denied the, the, his testimony in the Book of Mormon, but he never went back to Joseph Smith. Uh, there is one thing about Oliver Cowdery. There is no direct evidence that any of the total of 11 witnesses ever denied the Book of Mormon. There is indirect evidence that Oliver Cowdery may have done so. There is a poem that was published in a Mormon publication that said the Book of Mormon is still God's word even though Oliver denied it. Now, that's circumstantial. I don't know if, if it would stand up in court, but it is interesting. Yes, and is. the other thing is that we can find no evidence that those testimonies existed outside of the cover of the Book of Mormon, exactly. that they ever said or wrote those things down anywhere else. And even if they, they do exist somewhere, they prove exactly nothing. In fact, uh, I want to just throw out just a couple of quotes here uh, on all three of these, these men or just something that was said that ties in exactly with what y'all were talking about. On Oliver Cowdery, he was publicly charged by Joseph Smith and leading Mormons with stealing, lying, perjury, counterfeiting, adultery, and being the leader of a gang of, quote, scoundrels, end quote, or, or quote, scoundrels of the deepest degree, end quote. And that comes from uh, uh, the Senate document 189, February 15, 1841, pages 6 through 9, Comprehensive History of the Church, B.H. Roberts, Volume 1, uh, pages 438 and 439, just for documentation for those that like documentation. And Joseph Smith had a very high opinion of this man who was a witness to the Book of Mormon. Right. Mormon, now, he? the next one would be David Whitmer. It says uh, here that uh, he was cursed by leaders such as Sidney Rigdon. Whitmer was denounced by the prophet Joseph Smith as being a, quote, dumb beast to ride, end quote, and, quote, an ass to bray out cursings instead of blessings, end quote. And, of course, the documentation on that is from the History of the Church, Volume 3, page, page 228. And, uh, of course, the, the last one here in the Elder's Journal of August 1838, Joseph Smith denounced him, this is talking about Martin Harris, as, quote, so far beneath contempt that to notice him would be too great a sacrifice for a gentleman to make. The church exerted some restraint on him, but now he has given loose to all kinds of abominations, lying, cheating, swindling, and all kinds of debauchery. Just In eight quote. years after the, the Book of Mormon came on the scene. Right, and that's, uh, that's uh, Martin Harris, and uh, apparently that's coming from uh, 
gleanings uh, uh, by the way, C.H. Clark, pages 256-257. So anyway, I thought those were some interesting comments by mainly Joseph Smith on his own witnesses to the Book of Mormon. It sounds like they're not any more credible than, well, pick your liar. Well, if you, if you believe Joseph Smith is a prophet, then mm -hmm. you'd have to believe his witnesses are liars and swindlers. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a fan of Mark Furman at all. I think he is a scumbag, basically. But his credibility is greater than the credibility that Joseph Smith gave his own witnesses. And, and uh, one last thing I want to pick up, and then we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I want to wrap it up with some concluding thoughts from you gentlemen here. Uh, but I mentioned before when I showed the Joseph Smith Begins His Work uh, from the 1830 original mm -hmm. volume, mm -hmm. And I'm asking you who Wilford C. Wood was. I don't think we've got an answer to that. Who is <coughs> Wilford C. Wood? Is this an anti-Mormon who's putting this fake literature out about the original 1830 book of Mormon? He was a member of the Mormon church. He, uh, in fact, I've seen a copy of the letter where he said if that, those reprints that he put out injured anyone's testimony of the church, that was the person's fault whose testimony was injured, not the fault of the reprints. And interestingly enough... So was he, he dedicated to the Mormon church? He was. He, he thought this would help put, the church. He was not trying to put out literature that would attack the church. Right. And, and in his reprints, both Volume 1, which is the Book of Mormon, and Volume 2, which is the 1833 Book of Commandments and the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, there are, is an affidavit signed by Thomas S. Monson, who today is one heartbeat away from being the Mormon prophet, which says these are authentic reprints from the authentic originals. You can trust them. All right. And uh, as we'll discuss in the next episode, hopefully, we'll talk about some of the changes in the Book of Mormon, I mean, actual doctrinal changes, and uh, get into uh, some of the, well, what I want to talk about is uh, the 17 points of the true church, as mentioned by the, the, book, uh, the, the Mormon church. And as I've been signaled now, we have about one minute left. Uh, uh, Mike, go ahead and uh, give a uh, brief gospel message to any Mormons that may be watching right now, and then I'll sign off the show. To those Mormons that are watching, I want you to know that I bear my testimony that everything we've said today is true, and that Jesus Christ is not a God, but is God in the flesh who came and died on the cross for us and rose again. Because He is worthy, you too can have salvation. You can have eternal life because He is worthy and by trusting in Him. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can call us. And that's our testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Be with us next time as we continue in this series. God bless you all. Amen. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Two, two. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you.